Alright, this is Chapter 2, Section 2, Pyramids on the Nile. The vocabulary is Delta, Narmer, Pharaoh, Theocracy, Pyramid, Mummification, Hieroglyphs, and Papyrus. Now, next to Narmer, I would suggest including the name Menes, M-E-N-E-S, because Narmer was known by both names, and the textbook does have references to both when it comes to test time. Looking at the map, you'll notice a lot of desert and a green line curling its way through to a triangle at the top. The green line area is where the Nile runs. The Nile is the basis of everything in Egyptian civilization. It brings the silt, which we learned about last section, the nutritious soil, in order to grow plants with. The desert area is known as the redland, or deshret. The darker area where the actual plants are growing, the green line, is Kivet, or the Black Land. Think of it like going to, say, Home Depot or Lowe's or some other store and buying potting soil. That real dark black color is because of all the nutrients that are packed into it. So the darker land near the river is the land with the nutrients. At over 4,000 miles long, the Nile is the longest river in the world. It is not the biggest river in the world. That goes to the Amazon, which is wider and deeper. But for length, the Nile is the longest. In this picture, I tried to superimpose the United States for scale over where the Nile runs. I'm afraid it didn't come out very well, but I hope it gets the idea across. And the blue line on the left is if we were to straighten out all the bins in the Nile, roughly how far it would run. Like most everything else in Egypt, even the seasons are based around the Nile. The flood season, the recession season, or Peret, and the harvest season, or Shemu. During the flood season, the ground was covered in water, so people would go to work on building projects like the pyramids, temples, etc. During the growing season is when it was planting because the water had receded, and then the harvest season would allow you to stock up on the crops and harvest your goods. A portion of the crops would go to the government, which would then use them to pay you back as you worked through the flood season, waiting for your time to plant new crops. Each season was four months of 30 days each, making a 360-day calendar for the Egyptians. However, the Egyptians did understand it was a 365-day year. They kept five days that weren't on their calendar, so the calendar would come out nice and even, and those five days were their New Year's celebration, which were considered basically the birthdays of the gods. Trade was easy on the Nile. The river flowed from south to north. The wind blew from north to south. So basically, you put up the sail on the ship, you're headed south with the wind, you put it down, you're headed north with the current. The only time you'd really have to row a ship is if it was one of the huge style barges, which were just too heavy for the wind to move, or at times where the wind just wasn't blowing that day. The Nile also has several cataracts, cataract meaning constrictions that cause rapids. Or in the case of medicine, cataracts are constriction within the eye. But in this case, we're talking about constricting the water. Egypt was divided into two parts. The first part was the triangle at the north end. This was called Lower Egypt, and the triangle is called the Delta. The length of the river from the Lower Egypt to the first cataract was Upper Egypt. Now you'll notice Upper Egypt is further south on the map. The reason for this is because it wasn't named based on the map making. It was named based on the river flowing downhill from south to north, so the north end is actually at a lower altitude, and thus lower Egypt. Much like Mesopotamia, Egypt began as separate city-states. It was about 3000 BC when Narmer decided to unify them. He began conquering city-states and bringing them together. Narmer is also known as Menes, M-E-N-E-S, for those of you who missed it on the vocabulary part, so be prepared for both names when it comes chapter test time. He begins Egypt's first dynasty by uniting Upper and Lower Egypt. The stone pictured is the Narmer palette, which tells the story of the unification in a limited context. And at the bottom what we see is the crown for Lower Egypt, the crown for Upper Egypt, and a combined crown. This combined crown was symbolic of the pharaoh controlling both Upper and Lower Egypt simultaneously. Egyptian religion was polytheistic, having over 2,000 gods or goddesses. I've heard some reports of over 4,000. The Egyptians believed in an afterlife. It was originally meant for the rulers, but eventually opened up to the general people. Now, the reason for these situations, the multiple gods, is because during the unification of Egypt, when one city-state took over another one, 
Instead of banning the conquered city-states religion, it got incorporated along with all of its gods. And the reason for the afterlife originally being meant for the pharaoh is because the pharaoh himself was considered one of the gods. Now this gets a little complicated, I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible. Ra was considered the sun god and the creator of the universe in Egyptian mythology. He created a son and a daughter, Shu and Tefnut, the wind and the rain, who in turn had children, Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. They, in turn, also had children, Isis, the goddess of motherhood, Osiris, god of the dead, Nephthys, goddess of love, and Set, the god of chaos. Nephthys and Set get married, Osiris and Isis get married. But Osiris and Nephthys have an affair which results in Anubis, god of the funerals. That's the dog-headed one that you usually see in movies. Set grows jealous, kills his brother Osiris. Osiris is resurrected by his wife Isis, but becomes Lord of the Dead because he's been brought back from the dead, so he's the leader of the afterlife. Horus is Osiris' son from Isis, who grows up to take revenge and chases Set out into the desert in exile. In the process, Horus loses an eye, and when you see that unusual eye symbol in Egyptian hieroglyphs, is called the Eye of Horus. It's his all-seeing eye, according to their legends. The Egyptian kings were known as pharaohs, which literally translated as Great House. Kind of like how when the president gives a speech, we refer to it as an announcement from the White House. The pharaoh was the Great House because the palace was where he lived. Unlike in Mesopotamia, where the king was thought to be a messenger of the gods, the pharaoh was actually thought to be a reincarnation of Horus protecting Egypt. Now, government that is ruled by religion is called theocracy. Sometimes they believe the leader is a god. Sometimes they just believe that the priest class should be ruling in the name of the gods. But rule by religion is known as theocracy. You will be required to identify at least one of these symbols and its meaning. The crook and the flail were representative of the pharaoh. The crook is a shepherd's crook, like they used to guide sheep and represented the pharaoh's responsibility to guide his people. The flail was not a whip. It becomes a weapon in the Middle Ages, but at this point in time, it was still considered a farm tool. It was used to thrash wheat to get the uh, grain out of it. This represents the pharaoh's responsibility to keep his people fed and cared for. So the crook and the flail, feeding the people, and guiding the people. Now the scarab is the dung beetle. And the Egyptians believed that the sun was a great ball that was pushed across the sky. Likewise, a dung beetle gathers up a ball of dung, lays eggs in it, and pushes it into sunlight to keep it warm. So to the Egyptians, this was kind of a repeat on the ground of what the sun was doing above them, the ball being pushed. The Ankh is the Egyptian symbol of life, which the Romans would later adapt into an execution tool, and it would become the cross to Christianity. The cartouche is not the hieroglyphs, not the symbols in the middle, but the oval around it with the line at the bottom. Anytime you see an oval with the line, the hieroglyphs inside of it are a pharaoh's name. And lastly, we have the new crown of Egypt. Not like the one that we discussed with Narmer, but still symbolizing upper and lower Egypt through the cobra and the vulture, one for upper, one for lower. After death, it was considered important to preserve the body, as the body was considered a house for the spirit. If you didn't have the body, the spirit had nowhere to return to when it, well, for lack of a better term, slept. This process was called mummification. During mummification, many of the organs were removed and placed into jars called canoptic jars. The brain was extracted through the nose, the body packed in salt, and also stuffed to retain shape. The salt would dry it out, and about 70 days later, you have a mummy ready for burial. It's similar to the concept of making jerky, I suppose. This salt just absorbs the moisture and helps preserve the body. What you're looking at now is a section from the Book of the Dead. Contrary to what Hollywood says, it is not some black magic rituals. It is kind of a record of who the person was, their funeral rites, the burial, and the prediction of what was supposed to come in the afterlife. In this case, Anubis, the god of mummification, is escorting the soul to the Hall of Mott. In the Hall of Mott, you'll see the scales. The heart of the deceased is weighed against a feather of truth, a feather of Mott. If the deceased's heart is weighed down by sin, and he is considered a wicked person, it is fed to the little creature with the crocodile head there, who is the devourer of souls. And the person ceases to exist. There is no hell in Egyptian mythology. They just stop being. 
If they pass the test and the heart is lighter than the feather, they go to the bird-headed god, Toth, who then records the results and pa passes the soul on to Horus, the falcon-headed god, who introduces the deceased to his father Osiris, and then the deceased is welcomed into the afterlife. Most people are familiar with the idea of the Egyptian pyramids as tombs, but the first tombs in Egypt were the mastabas, pictured on the left here. The chamber at the bottom would be for the body, the shaft up for the spirit to depart, and then at the top section to the left edge, the hollowed out area there, would be a chapel for family to visit. It would be the pharaoh Dozier who would eventually have the step pyramid made for him, effectively one mastaba on top of another. Later would come Snefru, who would want the smooth-sided pyramid. The architects weren't too good at this yet, first attempts, and the angle was off, causing the top to be too heavy. It had to be slanted in. This design was actually rejected by Snefru, who had another pyramid rebuilt. Of course, the most famous of the pyramids are the three pyramids at Giza, the Great Pyramid and the two alongside of it. A lot of speculation has gone into the reason for the pyramid shape. The simplest is that a larger base is more stable, but other aspects can factor in as well. For example, the Egyptians thought the earth was flat and square, and many people have theorized that the idea of the pyramid comes from the concept of the sun, high above head at noon, shining its rays to the four corners of the earth. The Egyptians developed a writing style called hieroglyphs. The simplest way to explain it is the idea of taking a word taking its first letter and then using a picture of that word as the sound of that letter. So if I were to draw a picture of a dog, it would represent the D sound for dog. Now bear in mind that it's not going to line quite that nicely here because the Egyptian language, not all of their words are going to have the same as ours. For example, on the right hand column there are two areas that are sort of jagged lines running horizontally. These represent the letter N for Nile because the jagged lines represent the waves and the water. So hieroglyphs are the writing style. The biggest difference in record keeping between Egyptians and Mesopotamians is that Mesopotamians had used clay tablets while the Egyptians actually used papyrus. It's kind of like paper but stiffer and cracks easier made out of reeds from the swampy area of the delta in lower Egypt. For a long time we could not figure out how to read hieroglyphs. Eventually the discovery was made of the Rosetta Stone. It was discovered in 1799 by French soldiers under Napoleon, but it would still be a long time before people were able to use it as the key to unlock hieroglyphs. The way it worked was the lower third was written in Greek, the middle third in Demotic, a variation of Egyptian writing separate from hieroglyphs, and the top section in hieroglyphs. By understanding the Greek and the Demotic, it was possible to compare the two, see that they were the same text, and then compare them to the hieroglyph above and realize it was also the same text. Once that was done, using the hieroglyphs at the top as a key, it was possible to break the code of hieroglyphs in general. We may never know what ended this period of Egypt's history, which is referred to as Old Kingdom. Later we will follow it up with Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom. But according to legend, what happened was a weak pharaoh who had grown old and was being taken advantage of by his nobles. Allegedly, when he died, his son tried to rein people back in and get more power for the pharaoh again and was assassinated. That pharaoh's wife then becomes pharaoh. Her name was Nidokris. Supposedly, in a fit of vengeance, she ended up drowning all the people who had been involved in the political plots against her father and her husband, and then commits suicide by locking herself into a burning building. We do not have definite records of this. This is just the legend that's been passed down. What we do know is that about this time, Egypt enters into what's called the First Intermediate Period. Think of it kind of like a commercial break for Egypt. Everything is just plunged into chaos, no central government, but a government will rise again out of it.